Thank you, everybody. Glad to have everybody here. Hope everybody is safe and healthy and happy. And looking forward to a little bit of fall because, as Chris mentioned, it is pretty darn hot. So I'm going to go ahead and get going and, and start sharing my screen. But just for bandwidth purposes, if people will keep their videos off while while we're going and you're welcome when we get when we finish up if you'd like to if you'd like to turn your video back on you're welcome to do that while we do the q a at the end i know often people people do like that hmm, like to see that with the gates open a couple things just that chris didn't mention that i will do want to mention on September 19th, we have our Gardening in the South Symposium from 9 to noon. It'll be Basil Camus from Leaf and Limb. Bryce Lane and myself will we'll give some gardening tips. I'm really geared towards beginner gardeners, but anybody is welcome to this. We've, we've got space since we're doing it online, and so that is a free program. Uh, so you could register for that and nine to noon. So still gives you plenty of time to get out and garden. And then a couple of ongoing programs we have, again, with Bryce Lane, who is a phenomenal speaker. He's going to be doing home plant propagation starting next Monday, this coming Monday. And he's going to get you everything from, you know, the science behind what you're doing to the actual hands-on how to do things. And it is really geared for you being able to do it at your home, not needing a greenhouse, not needing a mist bench, but how you can do it at home. And really knowing some of that science behind it makes it, it's, it's like, you know, people who know how to bake, you know, if you know what you're doing and why things happen, then you can take a recipe and play with it and, and try different things. And it's the same thing with, with Bryce and this class. It's it's gonna be fantastic. He's really excited about it. So that, that's one of those things that makes it that much better. And then another one that is starting next Tuesday, another multi-class one. This is four classes. This is Bree Author, the who who has written the book on landscape uh foodscaping at your home and this is going to be this is really set up so that as you go through this week by week over the next four weeks you're really going to be you know in time to put all of these things into into play in your landscape and one thing that i want to emphasize with this is kind of hidden down here at the bottom, so I blew it up. It's not just for people with vegetable gardens or people who want vegetable gardens. It's, it's for any type of gardener. So I usually, in my sunny beds, I usually plant, you know, a, a couple of tomatoes. And after talking with Bree, I've done some other planting in my, just in my garden beds for things that I really like. And she's really helped me to do that. So even if you don't want to be a vegetable gardener, it's great. She can, she'll talk about containers, you know, and, and, and doing it in, in flower beds, the whole thing. So she practices what she preaches. So she's definitely got all the information for you. So just want to throw those out. So we'll jump right in and talk about some trees. This is actually a talk, it comes from a talk that I put together for two different grower groups, one for the eastern part of the state and one at the, on the western side of the state. So I tried to really hit plants that they, that they should be looking at now to, to have in production, plants that I think going forward will be good, and a few that are, that, you know, are a little more on the cutting edge. This is one, this is a, a sugar maple that's 
marketed as Bell Tower. Its name is Reba, but it's a very upright growing one. And, you know, sugar maples aren't always great for us, but this Bell Tower has been a very good grower. I've been really impressed with it. And, you know, urban trees one of the big problems with urban trees is, you know, branches that splay out and get in the way of cars and driveways and people on sidewalks and things like that. So a lot of times what designers are looking for are plants with more of that upright habit. So even if it, you know, if you start the branching at, you know, most cities, it's probably six feet is the standard for, for trees going in a, a cityscape. And, you know, at your home, you know, four to six feet probably. But even if you start down that low, the, the, le- the limbs go up, whereas at six feet, they go, if they go straight out, they're going to they're gonna smack people in the face, especially when they have leaves or they're wet and things like that. So these upright plants are great. And this, this Acer saccharum, this sugar maple bell tower is, is one to look out for if you're looking for an upright, upright tree and want good, good fall color. I don't think I have a picture of it color. Another great maple, Acer tetericum, the, oh gosh, I never can think of a common name for it, is a, Acer tetericum, just a really good, tough, urban tolerant tree. It'll take compacted soils, it'll take pollution, it actually does pretty well with its salt tolerance for in colder areas where they salt the roads a lot. This is it in kind of midsummer, one called hot wings. And it's called hot wings because the fruit, the, the maple seeds are bright red when they, when they form. They'll turn brown ultimately, but, you know, I came up on this tree and, you know, it was ways away and was trying to figure out what this flowering tree was. And I got there and it was the, the fruit on the, the, Acer tetericum. There you can see a closer picture and see, you know, really a heavy fruiter with that bright, bright red um, foliage. Kind of a smaller tree. This is, you know, usually 25 to 30 feet after, after 10 or 15 years, but it can grow taller. They tend to want to branch low. So if you want it, you know, more as a, a street tree or city tree, you'd want to get one single stemmed and, and, you know, make sure it doesn't branch too low before it, it starts going out because it'll, it'll spread almost as wide as it does tall. Another one, the trident maple, Acer bergerianum, and this is actually down on Glenwood South. They have these planted as, as street trees. And it's kind of, with age, gives you that typical look that you would get from a you know, a larger, a red maple, sugar maple, something like that, but just on a more modest scale, more like 35 feet, um, 25 to 35 feet in 10 years. They tend to be, again, much like the Acer tetericum, really tough in terms of urban conditions. So I really like them for that. And there are quite a few selections and more and more coming out all the time. This is a smaller one. Now this would be for a much smaller scale landscape. Mina Yatsabusa, which starts off almost like a little mound, but it'll grow up on a single trunk, especially if you encourage it, and make this really tough but delicate looking small tree. The the foliage is very narrow as opposed to the more typical wide uh, shape. This is one that's still on my lust list. It's an unnamed one in Japan that I would love to get a piece of this back or at least some seed so we could grow it out, but one where the new growth is really, really bright red. As far as I know, has has never been named or introduced, but it just goes to show that there's a lot of variation in this, in the trident maple, and there's a lot of room for improved forms for us. Another maple, Acer pictum variety mono, the painted maple. Another great kind of a smaller 25 to 35 foot tree. Nice rounded head. This is it in flower. 
So it has these yellow flowers on it. You, see, you can see the Japanese maple over here is just leafing out and other things in the background haven't quite leafed out yet. And so this is flowering very early and I, you know, it just, every time I see it, a, a large tree in flower, it, it knocks me out. I think it's so gorgeous. And we typically don't think of our maples as beautiful flowering trees. During the summer, it's got, you know, kind of your, you know, green foliage, but in the fall, it will often, not every year, but often turn this, this really beautiful buttery gold color. And you can see that's a broader leaf than some of these other mid-sized maples. So it's got more of that look of a sugar maple or a red maple in terms of the foliage. Now this one's just kind of cool. This is actually the one of the kind of southern forms of sugar maple. And this is more, Acer leucodermy is more of a you know, maybe 25 foot tall tree. This was one that was actually selected originally because the new growth was so bright red. But then when it was, Ted Stevens started growing it out, he realized that after that bright red early growth, it would do this. It would have dark green veins and then much paler in between. So he called it Confederate Ghost. It's not a really quick growing tree and it's still hard to find, but I think it's, it's very cool. I was actually just, I was out walking around the Arboretum and just admiring the second flush of growth that it had going on just, just yesterday or Monday. A really beautiful thing. And now if, if you've joined most of my talks, you know, I've talked before about Acer Fabry. This is one of the evergreen maples, very unmaple looking with its single leaves, but it's another one that in flower I think is just beautiful. Foliage is completely fine through our winters. I've seen a little bit of tip depth. It's a 15 to 20 foot grower in, in 10 years. That beautiful flower. And then again, like that Acer Tetericum, I guess that's Tetarian maple. Acer Tetarica, it has a bright red fruits that will turn brown as they age. But you can see those leaves. The leaves look like a, a um, you know, weeping ficus or something like that, much more than they do a, a maple. And again, I've talked about this other evergreen maple before. This is one that the Arboretum introduced. Acerlevagatum Hong Long that we collected in 2009 in, in China. It's new growth, really dark burgundy. It has been just fine in the garden for, it's been outside for nearly a decade. In some really cold winters, it, it lost some of its, its leaves, but recovered just fine after that. When you grow it in more sun, right now we have it in pretty shady spot, but when you grow it in more sun, it goes from this burgundy to kind of almost a lavendery color. It's a really odd color and then silvery blue. In more shade, it becomes more green than silvery blue, but it'll retain its foliage a little bit better during the winter. I think this is a real winter. It's got a nice shape, been a good grower. I'm actually hoping we get a really cold winter sometime soon so we can really test our plant but uh, yeah, it's a, it's a good one, I think. You know, kind of jumping from the evergreen maples, there are evergreen dogwoods. This is Cornus hongkongensis gecku. It's fully evergreen. As far as we can tell, it is the very hardiest evergreen dogwood, certainly the hardiest one that we've grown. It has your typical Cornus cusa flowers, the kind of four bracted, long petaled, and I'm not sure why I don't have a picture of that in here. I have plenty of those pictures. Maybe I was just thinking about fall, but this is in fall, it gets those same Cornus cusa like fruits. Interestingly, on a collecting trip not terribly long ago, maybe 2016, 
we found one with white fruit, kind of creamy white fruit. And when we asked, we have, a, we have a, the world authority on dogwoods is in the plant biology department here at State. And when I showed her the picture, she said, oh yeah, that's Cornus hongkongensis, the, that white fruited form they grow for food in China quite a bit. I'd never seen it, never heard of it there, but we've got some seedlings of it that are, that are coming along in the nursery. So hopefully we'll, we'll be able to get those out. I think that that could be a very cool new introduction to the U.S. And I wonder if the fruit tastes better because in my experience, the fruit is, it's one of those fruits where they, people say it's great in jellies as a, you know, as a jelly, which means, you know, take 20 fruits and add two cups of sugar and, you know, you, you're, you're, gelatin and you got jelly so anything tastes tastes good with you know a couple big scoops of sugar in there but that's it during during winter during a cold winter it, it turns kind of this plummy purple and then goes back green again really neat now i'm, I'm not an evergreen dogwood this is cornus wilsoniana this is a, a dogwood that we are super fond of. We actually just named our collection because ours that's growing at the Arboretum has the whitest bark of any I've ever seen. You know, and it was the one I learned from, so I assume they all had bark that good. Well, come to find out that they don't all have bark that good. We just wound up with a really, really spectacular one. So we just named it White Jade. So if you're growing cuttings from our plant, you can put the name white jade on there. But if you're growing seedlings, you should not because they will be variable. But you can see it can range from almost pure white like ours to this silvery to more of cinnamon and green for a dogwood. Now it grows much larger than our native dogwood. It's, it's more of a, you know, I think more of it in 10 years is you know, 30, 35 feet tall, especially if you grow it as a single stem plant, like you see it in the wild. Ours at the Arboretum is more multi-stemmed. But then it flowers with these beautiful flowers. And they're, they're kind of somewhere between the shrubby dogwoods with the really, really small flowers in tight clusters. And, you know, our native flowering dogwood or Acusa dogwood, they've got very distinct petals on the individual flowers. So the flowers are larger, but, but they're produced just in masses. It is really a beautiful tree when it's in full flower. Now, in full disclosure, people tell me that it's got some, a bit of a fishy smell for a couple of days when it first comes into flower, but I don't have a sense of smell, so I've never smelt it. So it's fine with me. Now another group that we really love, the red buds, a couple from the Arboretum, one we named Circus chinensis, K's early hope. You don't often think of the, the chinensis types as really great urban trees, but there are some growers, especially here locally, who are growing these as a single stem plant. So you get this kind of V-shaped head of heavy flowering, you know, at three or four feet, starting at three or four feet. So it makes kind of a small tree. But even as a, these kind of multi-stemmed large shrub or small tree to, to 15 or so feet, still, you know, you could put that fairly close to a road or something. And because all the branches go up, you wouldn't, you wouldn't really interfere with, with cars that are driving by. So I think it can be used that way. And Circus chinensis is certainly a tough, tough plant. They've got it planted around a lot of the, the dorms kind of between the Arboretum and campus. If you go in the back way, they've got them around some of the, the housing and things like that. And, you know, around student housing, if plants can survive, they're tough. One that's not from the Arboretum, but a real favorite of mine is Ace of Hearts, which is a smaller tree. So for a smaller spot, it's really more of a, a 12 to 15 foot tall tree, but it's a small form of our native one. And I love it. It's, it is maybe my favorite 
of our native dogwoods that are, you know, our favorite green leaf native dogwoods just over the summer for the foliage. I love, there's something about this small, perfectly aligned foliage. Every leaf seems like it was placed on there just perfectly. I, I really, I really like that. And while they're understory trees in habitat, and understory trees are often not really, uh, you know, they can't take tough conditions like compacted soils and things. If a red bud gets established, it's, it's awfully darn tough. This one is from the Arboretum. This is pink pom-poms with these double flowers. The double flowers are great for a couple of reasons. One, they're showy. They're more showy. Every individual flower just shows off more than the single flower types. But they also tend not to get pollinated. So they last longer on the plant than a single flowered one. And they also, some people don't like the fruit, the little bean pods that form on trees. And these will, will form very few of those typically, if any. Now, on the flip side, that means they're not good for pollinators. Um, so, you know, if you really want pollinators in your garden and you want all your plants to, to play a role in that, you know, this is not one you'd want. But Circus canadensis pink pom-poms is a really vigorous grower. It's one of the quickest growing common red buds that we have here. So I think in in 10 years, you, you're looking at 20 to 25 foot tall plant, but it's got a really good habit. The other, the other double flowered red bud is flame and flame is another, is a quick grower as well, but it tends to get very, very wide. So I think pink pom poms is a more useful urban tree than, than flame. Now, our most recent introductions, Golden Falls red bud, very strict, weeping, chartreuse, gold-leafed, deep-leafed one. Really like it. Good grower. It's tough. I've got one in a container at my house that I almost never water, and it has taken a beating. It looked rough for a while, but you know, you get some water on it and, and boom, you know, it flushes back out, does great. Those are, those should be available in pretty good numbers this coming spring. And then our other introduction from the same time is flamethrower. Pretty amazing plant, comes out burgundy and then corally copper and then chartreuse and all the way back in the middle, it'll be green. And it keeps on flushing out new growth. And again, I had this in a can container at home, a decorative container with the idea that I was going to water it. I know better than that because I don't water plants. Actually, the real reason was I want to put it somewhere, but I want to move the plant that's there. So I'm waiting until fall to move the plant that's there before I actually plant this. But I neglected it. It lost 95% of its leaves. You know, we got some rain. I did put a little bit of water on it. It's now flushed out. It's now got all these bright burgundy heart-shaped leaves that are doing their transition in color right now. So it is, it is a tough, a tough ombre there. So I really like it. It's cool. What I really want is to have a field of them so I can have this look going on at my house, but I don't have quite enough space for that. But that's, I think this is going to be one of the, the most, uh, most important flowering tree introductions in, in quite a while. And, and I didn't even show the flowers, you know, it does have the, the lovely lavender flowers in the, in the early spring before the leaves come out. Now, this is a plant that is not read, readily available, but it should be. In general, people should grow more carpinus. Horn beans are native horn beans, Asian horn beans. They are mostly all tough trees. They are beautiful. They are different sizes for different places. This carpinus fangiana, named for the, the great 
botanist, Dr. Fang, who spent a lot of time on Mount Ome, is, is noted, it's sometimes called the monkey tail horn bean because the flowers and then the, whoops, the little horn bean fruits are so long on there, they can be well over a foot long. And so it, they just dangle from the tree. And this is, this is it at the stage where it's kind of going uh, just past flowering and going into the fruit stage. And so these will actually expand with fruit a little bit more. But it's a, you know, in 10 years, probably a, a 25 or 35 foot tall tree. Wharton's Choice was one they named, they had, this is at the University of British Columbia Botanic Garden. They had three planted up near their entrance. And this one was the best one. So they named it for their director, Peter Wharton, who was a, a close friend of JC and is really is the best of the best, I think. Unfortunately, it's a little bit tough to graft. So we don't have that. We had it, we, we actually had two different clones in the nursery and well, let's just say there's a reason why we have locks on our greenhouse doors now. I'd really hope to plant them both, the two different clones out as a pair so we could get good fruit because with just, one clone, we don't get very good fruit on them, seed set on them. Now a much smaller one, Carpinus japonica in general is a smaller plant. It, it tends to be more of in 10 years, maybe a, a 15 to 20 foot tall tree. This form, silver lace, I've shown it several times, got this real almost like eyelash margins to the leaves with kind of a, a silvery uh, look to the foliage. Really want to get this going. We've we've rooted some and have grown some some from root rooted cuttings. They do not grow off very fast from rooted cuttings. So we're gonna we're actually gonna bring in some rootstock and try to graft a few of these, and see if we can get them growing a, a little bit better. This winter we're gonna do that. So. We're gonna cross our fingers, hope we can get it going. And because uh, I'd really like to distribute it to people. It's such a neat plant, it's got great texture. It's, you know, a smaller plant that a lot of people like. I just think it's, it's absolutely beautiful. And I couldn't talk about urban trees without talking about Chinese fringe tree. One of the best of the best. It's this is it in, in full flower. You can take the toughest of the tough conditions, you can grow it in some shade, and when it flowers, it is beautiful. There are male and female forms. This is what a male looks like. It's showier than a female. And uh, so a lot of times the name selections are male selections. But the nice thing with females is you get these fruits and kind of when it comes into fruit, you can tell that's when, that's the only time it really makes sense that this is in the same family as olives because this is what a, pretty much what an olive looks like when it's on the tree. But super tough. We're starting to get some more named forms of it, which is good. One of the most notable is Tokyo Tower, which is a, an upright male form although they can switch sexes occasionally in, in after really tough years. That, that happened to ours, the Arboretum, it went from male to female, it flowered, it, I mean, it fruited the year after the 2007 trout. I've got three Tokyo Tower planted alongside my house and I love them. They're just getting better and better. They're, I, I would think, you could, they would easily grow to 15 or 20 feet in, in 10 years, perhaps more. Mine are pretty darn vigorous right now. Um, but I, I think they're, they're great. Another Arboretum plant, Lagostremia farii fantasy. If you're going to grow a farii as a, as a street tree, I think fantasy is the one to do because the more typical 
Fourier form kind of arches out pretty low and usually you want things to go up higher, especially if you're going to have tractor trailers and things going underneath it. And fantasy is much more of a, a narrower vase shape habit. Super tough as well. This one has withstood half the visitors to the Arboretum standing on its roots to take a picture and it's not missing a beat. And that compaction is nothing to sneeze your nose at. It does the one caveat to that is it does root fairly shallowly like most crepe myrtles. And so I don't know if it's strong enough to, to tear up a sidewalk, but it certainly would be something to be aware of. The other one from the Arboretum is Townhouse, which has the nicest bark color of any Lagerstringia farii I've seen. Really. Depending on what time, of, what time of year you look at it, it may be pure cinnamon. It may have greens and grays and browns and whites in it, copper and orange. It's just, it's like a kaleidoscope. It is beautiful pretty much every day of the year. Doesn't even need to have flowers or leaves or anything else on it. Another slightly more unusual one, Euonymus carnosus growing in one of the toughest spots of any plant right there at our parking lot. You get a lot of abuse when you're by there. But this is a plant that we've never seen. I've grown quite a bit of this and never seen Euonymus scale on it, so I don't think that's a problem. It's, it's a nice green leaf plant during the summer. It has Kind of interesting white flowers followed by kind of thick fleshy fruits, but they're not a nuisance on the ground. But really why I think this deserves a place in any garden that can fit it is the, the color it gets when it goes into fall. And so it'll start, you know, you get this color in the fall and it will continue and continue it's often still looking good in December. I've, I've had still had beautiful leaves on it into January. So it really extends that fall color season in the garden. And if you look around kind of behind it, you see, uh, you know, trees are no leaves on this. There's a red bud right there. There's some trees over here that don't have any leaves on them. It looks like a river birch, not a leaf on it. So it's, you know, it's, it's holding it pretty late, even in this picture. Green Gable, black gum. This is probably, if there's been one tree that I've recommended in recent years to landscape architects and designers more than any other, it's this Green Gable black gum. You can see it's just got a perfect outline and while I like things to be different and change and not all look the same, there's a reason people love Bradford pears, especially designers, is because every one of them looks exactly the same until they all start falling apart. But this green gable has upright branches. So again, if you're planting it by a walkway or, or driveway, the branches are gonna tend to go up rather than out and hang down. But just, just absolutely perfect habit real easy to grow, very tough, and then it gets great fall color, which I don't have a great picture of, but it gets really nice bright red color like you'd expect from, from a good black gum. And it's native, so I, I've been telling a lot of folks, you know, hey, you should try Green Gable. I think you'll like it. And they all do. Ginkgos, ginkgos are always great. This is one that's Introduced in Europe is Blagon. I think it probably has been given, you know, has probably some other names in the U.S., but it's, it's interesting. It seems in recent years, I'm, I keep getting emails with a picture of a beautiful, narrow, upright ginkgo that people say, hey, this has been growing for the last 20 years, you know, in this street in my town, and hey, this has been growing here. And so I think we're going to see more and more of these columnar ginkgos coming out. And I think they're going to be just absolutely 
fantastic plants, whether you keep them limb to the ground or some growers are growing them up with four or five feet before it goes into kind of this little pyramidal, you know, upright shape at the top. But yeah, I think, I think this is, this is a real winner. And of course this is it in the fall when you get that great fall color, the rest of the time you'll have that, that really nice spring green and ginkgos are tough plants. They're great as street trees and parking lot trees and things like that. Uh, one of the best trees of all time. Our native, woefully underused yellowwood, Cladrastis kentuckia. This is it in flower. It's usually in, in flower in kind of mid to late spring. And you see it's all leafed out. And then just these, these clusters of white flowers that just hang like little icicles. People who've seen nice plants in flower love it. They try and look for places they can put it into their landscapes. There's some great gardeners I know from Philadelphia to, to right here in Raleigh who, you know, when they had space for one tree, this was the tree they picked to put in there. Now, Part of the reason why it's not as more popular than it is is because they are ugly young trees. So unless you buy a really big one, bald and burlap from a nursery, you are going, you know, if you get a 10 or 15 gallon container plant of this, it's gonna look sad. It's gonna be a stick in a pot with maybe one or two branches off the side and you'll plant it and think, what on earth am I thinking? but give it a couple of years and it will be gorgeous. There is a pink tinged one called Perkins Pink. Color is better in colder climates than for us. I think this is one where the white is much better than the, the pink. Another one that I've shown probably several times over the course of this summer, but I love it. Styrax japonicus evening light. This is a really dark purple leaf form, tends to be a little bit shrubbier, wants to grow as a multi stemmed plant, but I've also seen growers growing it upright grow on a trunk, but it always seems to have this really very upright habit. So I, I really like that. Flowers, pretty much pure white with these dark pedicels and the dark leaves. It is one of the best purple leaf small trees we can grow here in the south. It, it really holds the color better than most any other purple leaf plant. Another little kind of dwarf one. I'm a, I'm a big believer in, I, I really like tilias, lindens. Tilia cordata is the little leaf linda, linden. This one sold as summer sprite, halca, is a, is a dwarf form. It's got We've had ours growing for a long time. It was in the laugh house. We dug it out. This is it. That's it. You know, a year, two years later, didn't really miss a beat at all. But they make these perfect little gumdrop shapes. So if you don't have a lot of space, summer sprite is a great one. If you have more spray space, some of the other lindens, some of the other tilia cordatas are really great plants. They have very fragrant flowers, not showy, necessarily but but really fragrant and I wish we grew more of them if, if and I just tell people this because it, it for people who are big readers and read British novels they'll talk sometimes talk about you know having an alley of limes or they go sit under the lime trees or the limes were flowering and smelled beautiful something like that those are lindens, those are tilias, not citrus trees, not lime trees like you know, lemons and limes. They are lindens and they have, some of them have just overpowering fragrance. In fact, one of, we have a, a different species, kind of an unusual, more unusual species growing near the, the front of our McSwain Education Center. And when, when the linden is in flower, I always tell the volunteers who are inside, whoever's working inside, that I point out which tree is in flower because people will 
invariably walk inside and say, what am I smelling out there? And they, they find it hard to believe it's this plant. Parodia subequalis, another great, fairly recent introduction to horticulture, really didn't get into the U.S. until about 2007 or so. But we're finding it to be very quick growing, very quick, has phenomenal fall color. It's one of the first things to start showing color in the fall, and it will keep showing for a long, long time. And it ranges from dark purple, almost black, to bright orange and red. We've got, ours is multi-stemmed, but I'm seeing it grown as a single stemmed plant more and more, and it is awesome. Now, it won't always, as a single stem plant, it won't have that perfect head that a lot of designers like, but it will have kind of this upright, irregular head that and it's really nice. I like that. I'm, I'm really amazed with this. And it is easy to propagate and I think it definitely needs to be more in the the trade it's it's does not have insect problems disease problems it's related to witch hazels not very showy in flower but fall color is there's there's not much better than this even if you go up north there's not much better than this there's there's the same plant this is, you know, several years later, you can see we've limbed, limbed it up on the bottom a little bit to make it into more of a tree. Probably need to limb it up a little bit more. This is a little bit later in the fall than this picture. So you see kind of some of the leaves have started dropping on it, but it will, it will keep color for a long, long time. Another kind of smaller form of tree that, that is often grown, Zelkova serrata city sprite. Zelkovas are elm relatives and they all tend to have these very tight branching angles, which we typically think of as, as not super desirable in a tree, but it doesn't generally affect Zelkovas. But this one is you know, half the size or less of a typical Zelkova serrata. So it was really designed to, to be where power lines are overhead. Now, unfortunately, our power lines are too low, and so they've cut a little chunk out of the back of ours here. But it's, it, is, it is certainly the smallest Zelkova serrata tree I've seen. There's some really weird kind of dwarfy things that aren't really trees at all. But I'm, I've been really impressed with this, and it's just the perfectly shaped head on there. In fact, my biggest concern as a young plant was I, it looked almost top heavy, like the top was too big of this kind of round head on this little lollipop st stem. And Zelkovas are variable for us for color. Some years you'll get great color on some plants, and it can be purples and reds and oranges and, and golds. Other years, you'll get kind of a yellow to tan. It really just depends on the year. A few magnolias that I think are great. Coral Lake is one. It's not a giant magnolia. It tends to flower pretty late for magnolias. So it doesn't get blasted by the cold very often. But it's just got a nice regular shape that I think makes it a good good plant. Magnolias don't like a lot of root disturbance, so it's not a good urban tree for where you're going to have a lot of people walking on top of its roots and, and digging around it and things like that, but otherwise really nice. And one of the better ones, better deciduous magnolias, I think, for urban settings. Our native Magnolia grandiflora, you know, the southern magnolia, this is one that's called southern charm but sold as teddy bear. This is probably the other most the other tree that I recommend to landscape designers. If you are going to plant a magnolia in or grandiflora, southern magnolia, as part of any 
commercial landscape, urban landscape. Right now, I don't think there's a better one than, than Southern Charm, just because it keeps this very, very dense habit where other ones can be open and kind of see through. It's got great backs to the leaves. And because the way the, the branches kind of go up, you can see the backs of those leaves. The two big problems with it, and really the only problems I see are, one, it is not a prolific bloomer. Now it flowers, and you can see there are flowers getting ready to open on this kind of all over on it, but not as prolific as some other ones. And because the branches are a little bit upright, if you have a really wet, heavy snow or an ice storm, you, you can stand a chance of breakage, but that's true for kind of any Southern Magnolia. We do have one Sweet Bay Magnolia that I kind of like that I think would be good as a street tree. It's one of the little leaf ones called Kusa, and there's a few of these named after rivers in Alabama. Kusa has been the toughest one as far as what I've seen, but it's just, it's a little bit smaller habit, nice size flowers, and then one thing people don't always consider when they're thinking about urban landscapes are is the leaves, you know, how much of a mess will it make when everything drops? And these have these really small leaves. Those are only about two or three inches long and an inch wide. So, so you don't have a lot of mess as it, as it sheds the leaves. It is a Southern form variety Australis, so it'll tend to be evergreen, but still all those leaves will ultimately fall. And one that probably not as a street tree, but maybe more for an urban landscape. You know, if you're, you know, want to put something in front of a big air conditioner unit or something at, at a building is this Magnolia serendipity. And this has been a very vigorous plant for us. It's probably 12 or 15 feet tall and wide after eight years or so in the garden. It flowers all at once really heavily kind of over, over a, a several weeks in spring, early April to almost May. Cold doesn't seem to phase it. You know, it is uh, just, just absolutely gorgeous when it's in flower. And it, I mean, these, these stems will just be flowers from, for about you know, two feet of the stems once it really gets going. Excellent plant. And there are, Quite a few, there are quite a few growers in the area who are starting to carry this. They really like this. And one that I'm getting to love is one called Eternal Spring that we have kind of over by our lath house as well. Like a lot of the deciduous, I mean, evergreen uh, magnolias, it can look a little beat up coming out of winter, sometimes lose some leaves at the tips and things, but it seems pretty hardy compared to a lot of them. And it starts flowering early, like February. And it just keeps flowering and flowering and flowering into the spring. Eternal spring is ripe. So if you get a cold snap and these flowers are open and it, they turn brown, they'll fall off and new flowers will open. It just keeps going and going and going over a really extended period. Probably takes a little bit of work, more work to keep it in, a, in really a great shape, but kind of a loose hedging plant or, you know, a specimen that's a little bit farther away, something that, you know, you want to draw eye, people's eye to, you know, I think it's a, it's a great plant for that. Osmanthus fragrance. Lots of us grow Osmanthus fragrance, right? But we all grow it as a shrub. There are a handful around Osmanthus fragrance and Fortunii around Raleigh that are really old. I don't know how old, but they've, they've over time been limbed up into, into small trees. And growers could, could really start with that and grow these into small trees in a reasonable amount of time, something that they would be able to, to, to sell at a, at a reasonable price. This is one that's sheared but you see, and you can see the kind of the stem under there. This this nurseryman in China, I mean, he grow. That's all he grows. It's the only way they grow it. They don't they don't grow it as a shrub. You know, that's that's one they dug from the wild, because that's what it'll do. So you know, they they cut off about 
15 feet of it here. So what, 5, 10, 15, 20, 25. So 40 feet tall. Does anybody ever tell you your osmanthus can grow 40 feet tall? But what I especially like, osmanthus fragrance orantiacus, the orange flowered osmanthus. These always have a really nice shape without, without working on them. They, they often take a little bit longer before they'll come into flower. So growing it an extra year or two as a single stemmed plant makes sense because by the time you sell it, it'll be flowering size. And who isn't going to love that? You walk into somewhere in the fall looking for a tree, you know, everybody told you trees are for plant, uh, you know, falls for planting trees. And you go in there and you've got a bunch of, you know, sad looking deciduous trees and things. And then sitting at the nursery and then you have this bald and burlapped or, or growing in a big container, single trunked, round headed plant with incredibly fragrant orange flowers right when you're going to pick out plants. Yeah, I think those will sell. One that we're hoping to, that we'll get into the trade sooner or later, Pinus bungiana, great wall. This is this kind of perfectly shaped lace bark pine. So you grow it like this, you limb it up a little bit because inside there you got this great exfoliating silvery bark and patches, it's, it's gorgeous. Really hoping this one gets, gets in the trade, but it's, Pines can be hard to graft. People don't like to do it. So we, we're working with some, some young grafters to try and get them to, to really move on this plant because I think it's a winner. Some other conifers. The umbrella pines used to be terribly expensive, Cydopodus verticillata, but growers have figured them out and they've, they're, now they're just expensive, not terribly expensive, but Joe Cozy is a really nice tight form of of this plant i think think it should have more uses podocarp we uh, introduced with the university of florida sunshine spire a very narrow podocarp has been perfectly heat tolerant it's it's been a slow kind of goer for us so far they haven't grown as quick as some of the other podocarps so we'll see if they really have a future in the, the nursery industry Daphnophyllum, they're grown mostly as shrubs, but you can limb them up into trees. We've done that a little bit. In the wild, they grow as trees. This is not one in the wild, but this is from wild seed. And this is the best form. These are the forms that I really want to get. And we've, we've gotten seed of this from the University of British, um, excuse me, from Washington, University of Washington Arboretum where they had these and which they were just gorgeous but you can see you know that's a tree and actually this is down a ravine so there's about probably eight feet of oops, eight feet of trunk clear there but then where there's all these whirls of leaves all the petioles are red so we i really like this form and want to find a really good seed selection seed source for it so we're going to grow some out if we get these red petioles we're going to plant them all together kind of at a, a different uh, spot and be able to collect seed off these so we know that everything will give us this, this kind of look. Very underused native, Cirilla racemiflora. This grows down southeast in both swampy areas and kind of the sand hill. So it it's, tolerates all kinds of conditions, maybe the one of the best pollinator plants you can grow. All the little native pollinators love this thing. You get some great fall color for it as well as you, you go into winter. It's semi evergreen, but a lot of the foliage, older foliage, will turn bright red. And one they use in eight, kind of like the the osmanthus in Asia. They use this a lot. Dendropanax trifidus. Now this is an ivy relative. It's evergreen, small tree, grows, grow a single stem or multi-stemmed. 
has kind of neat flowers and in the winter it's evergreen but in the winter it'll turn this burgundy and then go back to green it's a neat plant and I, it's easy to propagate it's easy to grow I just can never figure out why it isn't more more widely grown and i love some akuba so I had to put in a akuba akuba omiensis is a tree form of akuba this this one is probably it's probably about 15 feet tall i know i could barely reach some of these fruits and this one it was weird i couldn't tell if these were going to turn red typically they're these are red fruits and in other areas just a little bit farther up the mountain where i saw these these were red fruited but these have white fruits so kind of a neat thing but we grow it here we've got some hardier forms than the old forms that that used to be grown I'm really thinking this could have potential. It seems to be a pretty quick grower as well. And I think this may be my last one. Another plant that I love, and I put it in talks all the time, so if you've heard me talk about it a bunch of times, I'm sorry. Acaceloiana. This is NCSU hardy, a, a hardier form of this. This is a little bit marginal for us. It can be, but this, this one is, is a hardier form. They are so hard to propagate. They just don't root very well at all. We get really low percentages, but they have these gorgeous flowers. It's evergreen. If you grow it down at the coast, you can get fruit, the pineapple guava, that is his common name, which are really tasty little tropical fruits. But also with these, especially on NCSU Hardy, I'm finding the the petals are really super, super sweet. I grow another variety at my house and the petals were not as sweet on it as NCSU Hardy, which was a little disappointing for me, but I'm hoping I'll get fruit on it. So, and we grow that variety here as well, but we haven't, haven't had fruit on it yet. Haven't had them in the ground long enough, but I think it's just a beautiful tree. So to finish up with not trees for urban landscapes, but what will be on our, our cart tomorrow, our plant buggy outside our gate, we've got the pink fruited form of American beauty berry, which if you've heard some of my other talks, I always talk about the, our American beauty berry is great as an insect, as a mosquito repellent. You take the leaves, crumple them up and rub them all over you. And it does, it does at least as well as deep woods off as far as I'm concerned and keeping mosquitoes away. A really cool plum yew, cephalotaxis. Mary Fleming just grows as a really low carpet, only about a foot tall and eight feet wide over time. Chris's pass along dianthus. Maybe when I finish up and, and open it up, Chris can tell you a little bit more from it, but it was a plant that he brought us to the Arboretum. Arboretum that he had been growing since he had been in Texas without a name. We planted it. It's a, such a good grower, such a good doer. We just call it Chris's pass along because he passed it along to us. A fats hetera. This is a variegated fats hetera. This combines the shrubbiness of fatsia with kind of the vininess of ivy and it becomes something that's kind of semi viney shrubby. The two best ways to grow it are to plant a bunch of them together and keep it trimmed back so it grows kind of into a shrub or even just one that you trim back regularly to make it a shrub or to plant it right near a tree. It won't climb the tree, but it'll kind of lean up against the tree and grow up with it over time and cascade down and kind of form like a little skirt around the tree. Whoop. A somewhat weeping. I think somebody was over, over enthusiastic about its weeping habit, but decidu a native deciduous holly, bright red fruit. Cedar waxwings love it. Gold variegated hardy jasmine. So you get yellow flowers in early spring and then kind of chartreuse gold foliage. You can also grow it as a as a really dense vine if you want to kind of give it support and tie it up 
a mangave called inkblot. Not hardy, you don't want to plant it out now, but you can certainly grow it inside very easily. They grow very quickly, make a real good show next year out in containers. And a hardy Syningia, Cherry's Jubilee, I've got this. It's been flowering in my garden since probably 1st of June. Hummingbirds love it. It is tough as nails. It'll form these massive tubers. Sometimes over time, they'll push themselves up to the surface. I like to dig them, divide off any smaller tubers, replant it deeper. It wants to be in well-drained soil or else it rots out, but otherwise super easy. Mine's just getting really uh, started in terms of, of being great. So we will end it there. I am happy to answer questions. People are welcome to come off of, to put their videos on if they would like. But yeah, it looks like there's a fair amount in the chat. And Chris? You wanted more comments about the Dianthus. I've yeah. had it for about 30 years, and it reminds me very much of just a Sweet William, which is a biennial that dies after a couple of years, but this one just goes and goes and goes. It has never produced a seedling in my yard. What's really weird about it, it seems to grow on my sidewalk better than it does in the garden, which I find is very weird because it has no root system down into the concrete, but that's always where it's happiest. So I'd plant it next to a wall, if you could, or it's just some rocks or something. It's the one super duper bright color pink. We yep. got it from a neighbor in Texas who had it for a number of years, who herself got it from her mother. So it truly is a pass along plant. When it's done flowering, I take the head shears too and just whack them all off at one time. It'll reflower just a little bit, just enough to be pretty, but nowhere near as much as it does in late April and early May. And they're nice tall foot plus long stems. So it makes a great cut flower as well, but just, just a very fun plant. And other than pruning it after it flowers, I don't think I've really fertilized the thing. I don't think it actually like it since it likes growing on a sidewalk. Yeah. Uh, I don't water it. I don't do anything to it. So it's just a really good, tough plant. And hey, it lived in Texas. And uh, if, if something lives over there, you know it's tough. Uh, I don't bend down a whole lot, Marilyn, to smell it. But as far as I know, it's a classic dianthus, kind of a yeah. cinnamony-ish. clovey cinnamon smell, yeah. yeah. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken but uh, it's just super pretty. But there were some questions, Mark, in the chat that I just wasn't too comfortable asking. Okay, uh, yeah. So I'll see if I can find some of them. All right, and I'll, I'll answer a few that I see here towards the end. Sassafras, somebody asked, what about any sassafras? I love sassafras. I don't really think of them as, as terribly urban tolerant. You need to get container grown plants. They don't transplant very well unless they're container grown and don't love uh, a lot of disturbance or compacted soil. I think of them more as a, you know, a more of a landscape plant than real urban tolerant one. Would you plant the syningia from the plant cart out now or hold till spring? Oh gosh, plant it now. I don't, I don't want to hold anything till spring. Thoughts on Amelanchia grandiflora? I love it. It's a beautiful plant. Another one that I don't, Around down here in the southeast, I don't really think of amelanchiers as great urban plants. They're fantastic plants, they're beautiful, good for wildlife, but they they can suffer under kind of urban conditions, especially compacted soils. And then if they start to suffer, they're in the rose family. And while they don't usually get you know, a lot of the diseases that can affect other rose family members like, you know, apples and cherries and plums and things like that and, and roses, of course, and, and some of those things. When they're really stressed in an urban setting, they can start to get some of those things. So I tend to, I would tend to keep those for more of a woodland type garden than that sort of thing. Well, I found a couple questions. Yep. So Lori asked, can that evergreen dogwood that you discussed tolerate full sun? Yes. And then Kathy asked, how big are the fruits? How big are the fruits? They are same size as a Kusa dogwood. So what's that, an inch and a half, inch and a quarter? 
And Annabelle asked if the flamethrower will hold on to the color and the shade. And I mentioned that uh, probably be much more colorful in the sun to begin with. Yeah, yeah. It's it color is going to be best on that in in the sun, and it is super sun tolerant. It's growing out in the open fields in Oklahoma and in Israel, where it's being produced. And man, they love it. Have you seen fall colored any of those uh, new cultivars? I'm assuming it's just the yellow is bet at best. Yeah, I mean it's it kind of continues with the color that it that it is. Like a lot of plants, it's it's going to be best. Color is always going to be best. The not not the first year it's in the ground, but that second year and the third year is really when it was really going to show off. But even sitting in a container in the nursery in the back here at the uh, arboretum looks pretty darn good. I think the next question is in reference to the Nissa. They wanted to know, or Kathy wanted to know, if the branches are stronger from than Bradford's. Oh yeah, and this is are uh, really tough. The black gum are really tough. It's uh, it's one of those. It's a native tree that you find in mesic woodlands. You know, down where it's it's damp almost all the time, at least seasonally, and then you find it in dry, dry woodland areas. Sometimes it's you know, if you go into a beech forest, uh, and this is about the only other tree you'll find that that can grow them. So they're super, super tolerant of, of almost any conditions. And yeah, they are very, very strong wooded. They, they, don't, they don't seem to have, to have a problem with branches breaking, except every time we, we plant a Nyssa wildfire here at the Arboretum, as a young plant, a bird or something comes through and sits on the, the, the growing point and breaks it off. And we never get a really nice shaped tree when we try and grow wildfire, which is the most widely grown black gum but that that green gable black gum that should be much more widely used i would i would if i were going to be planting out an la and i wanted that that perfect shape all to be identical all going down that would probably be my number one my number one choice that was nice and you, and you may not know this one john asked what was the green tree next to the ginkgo May not know that one without going back to it. The green tree next to the ginkgo. <laughs> right, ask me another question. I'll, I'll get there. Oh, the, the things that uh, were cut into squares? Is that what you're talking yeah, about? The, that, the, the green square next to the ginkgo. Oh, I have to look at that. I don't know. I would, I would put what's this what's the saying dollars to donuts that that's that that is a beach being pruned into that shape to be planted out as hedging mm -hmm. that picture was from europe they they like that they do that with each annabelle asked if teddy bear will hold on to its shape and shade and i commented it probably will be much more open in shade as how the magnolias just typically are yeah but not a whole lot more open it'll it'll it really does hold that shape very very well i see this uh, carpinus carolineana that that you recommend there are for a long time there really wasn't much out there other than the straight you know, just be seedling grown, seed grown ones. But there are some great ones, not, well, let me take that back. There are some ones that are out now that I have not tried, but we, we're, we're working on getting some of those in. Hold on, I think I have a catalog here. I'm gonna give you the name of a couple. Um, we, there's some now that are being selected for fall color. And I'm not sure if, if that's going to be great for us or, or if it's more for people up north. But there's, there's one called Wisconsin Red that perhaps is, you know, obviously that's from farther north, but it might have better fall color for us. I feel like there was another one that I saw recently in a catalog. 
I would look, I would personally, if you're, you know, if you're growing one and you really want it as a specimen, I would look for a named variety, but I've never seen a, a seedling that wasn't a pretty nice one. Oh yeah, this is, this is the other one that I was thinking of. There's one called Native Flame that's supposed to get a really nice color. And then there's also one called Rising Fire. And I have seen that one. I haven't seen the fall color on it. It's supposed to be good, but it's a much more upright habit, the Rising Fire. So if with less space or whatever, that, that may be a, a better one. It's, it's about half the width of a, of a typical Carpinus. Carolinian. Um, if there's any other plants for a sunny, wet spot other than Cirilla? For a sunny, wet spot other than Cirilla, well, Nissa will be fine there. Yep. Virginiana, doesn't that one kind of grow Magnolia, in a wet spot? Magnolia Virginiana, yeah, yeah. I mean, I guess it depends on how wet it is. You know, if it's not overly wet, Carpinus is okay. You know, I have to go through the Rolodex in my head, but um, yeah. Linda has some photographs to send you. I think it's of the plant she talked about last week. Was that the um, persimmon? Oh, yeah. You, know, you, know, you can uh, I'll put my email in here and it's on the website. It's so frustrated when I'm trying to reach somebody and I can't find their email or phone number on the website. They got, you know, the one thing that you've got to send all, all the messages through. I like talking to people. Comments about Euscaphus japonicus. Man, Euscaphus japonicus is incredible. It is such a good plant. And I've seen it growing in really tough spots, especially in Asia. And every time I see it in the fall, I'm from a distance. I'm like, what is that tree flowering red? But great flowers and then the fruit are just knock your socks off. Biggest problem with Euscaphus japonicus is it takes a lot of work for nurserymen to get a straight trunk and grow it upright and, and nice. It tends to want to be gnarled and contorted. But if you, get, if you start with a young plant and, and stake it and train it to get a good trunk on there, unless you want it gnarled and contorted. Man, it's, it's so good. So good. I've also heard it kind of a pain to even get started from a seed because they have a possibly even a multi-year stratification yeah. process going on. They've got a double dormancy, which is probably good because they, they produce a lot of seeds. So it's probably good that they're not too, they don't pop up all over the landscape. Yeah. And where is the best place to buy Redbud Golden Falls? I would first check with our our what's the word? Our benefit providers. You know, Homewood Nursery. You have to help me out with all the rest of them because we have so many of them that they kind of zip in and out. I don't know if big bloomers will get them in, but they may, but Homewood, Fairview, Garden Supply in Raleigh. What I would say is get in touch with your, whatever, you know, your, your favorite garden center, your good garden center, and ask if you can put in a request for a plant for this fall or spring. And a lot of times, a lot of garden centers will allow you to do that. And you can put in a request for you know, Golden Falls Red Bud. And that way, when they come in, they'll give you a call and you can get out there and get it. There's the, the benefit providers in the email. Excellent. Yeah, Chris put benefit providers in the email. And again, that's on our website too, under the support tab. And if you're if you're not using those, you're really missing out on some great deals. I use it all the time for all kinds of stuff. And if you're not a member, you're missing out on 
the benefit providers. So did I just freeze or did Mark just freeze? A benefit just from nurseries. Yeah, and one other great benefit that I should mention now, because it's kind of that time of year, if you are a member, on October 3rd, we have our big plant giveaway. You can go on YouTube and look up Friends of the Arboretum plant distribution, and you can see what it has been in the past. It will be different this year. It will be a uh, curbside pickup giveaway, but we will be giving away great plants to, to our members this year. And every year we do that. And of course we have members only plant sales as well. And you know, some of these plants that, pe that people ask, where can you get it? And the answer is nowhere unless we propagate it. That's where we, we often do the plants. And that's where we, you know, you, that's often where people get, get these plants. Uh, if you go to any of our longtime members gardens, they have got the most insane plants. And in the, in the chat, Catherine Wall has put in a link and that link is because of how we're doing the giveaway this year, curbside pickup, we need to know how many people are coming. So there is a form for you to fill out just so we know that you're coming because we don't want to make 500 bags and have 300 people show up, but even more so, we don't want to make 300 bags and have 500 people show up. Where can you find Magnolia Eternal Spring? If Camellia Forest and Garden Treasures aren't growing it, I would do a Google search and see if you can find a mail order nursery that has it. If not, I would get in touch with both of those nurseries and say you would love to grow it and you know it's at the Arboretum and maybe they, they will be interested in propagating some for you. We'll be happy to, to let Pat or, or David get, get cuttings of it to propagate. And I'll also mention that to one of the, the wholesale growers in the area who does a lot of grafting. I'll let him, he's the one that's growing the serendip, Magnolia serendipity for people. So I'll let him know. Questions I saw in the chat, Mark, unless there's anything new. All right. I should say that the, the sign up for the plant giveaway deadline is September 15th. So just because we have to have time to make this all work out for, for everybody. So if you're a member, sign up if you're going to come and if you're a not a member and you would like those free plants sign up uh, become a member before the 15th so you can sign up and get that if you're a little bit late on your on your membership you know if you're waiting for the paycheck to come in to do that 50 dollars membership and it doesn't come in until the the 18th you know we, we can probably still get you on the list so make sure you you do that. Best pollinator plant, the one that I talked about, is that for Maggie? That was Cirilla racemiflora. Is that what? Uh, yeah, that's what I was asking about. Oh, thank you. Cirilla racemiflora. It's, it's hard to track down. Woodlanders is probably a good place to get it. It's such a good plant. It's such a good plant. Denny well, Werner, the breeder of those red buds and former director here, he was another he was another person like me who just absolutely loved that plant. Other questions? All right. Well, thank y'all all so much. You know, make sure you you Sign up for your free plants if you're a member and you want to come by on October 3rd. We don't hold them. You got to be there October 3rd in the morning. And, you know, if not, if you'd like to support us and like us to continue doing these kinds of things, please, please join and help us. Thanks a lot, y'all.
Thank well, you. Let's stay at three. Bye, Thank everyone. Thank you Have so much. See you, see you next you. Wednesday. See you next Wednesday.